hello everyone. My name is uh, Jenna Lodico and welcome to this virtual edition of FEMC 2020 conference, taking a bite out of ocean education. Um, as I already said, my name is Jenna and I am the NMEA chapter rep of FEMC and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this isn't exactly how we do our normal conference presentations uh, and none of us here uh, at FEMC are Zoom professionals. Um, so we appreciate your understanding if we do happen to run into any technical issues uh, as we uh, do this session. Uh, this presentation should take about 40 to 45 minutes with time for questions at the end. Um, so for a, for a total for about an hour, uh, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box um, on your screen throughout the presentation. And at the end, we'll have time for questions. Uh, so I am now pleased to introduce you to Hannah uh, Med for our presentation. Hannah is the president and lead scientist at the American Shark Conservancy, and she oversees the organization's research and outreach efforts. Hannah received dual undergraduate degrees in marine biology and ecology from Florida Tech in Melbourne and a master's of science in zoology from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. She focuses on applying science to conservation needs and engaging the communities that are involved in, in that are invested in healthy shark populations uh, like, the di like divers and anglers. Uh, welcome, Hannah. What I'm going to do is make you the host of this meeting now, and you can go ahead and share your screen and give your presentation. Uh, whenever you're ready and sharing your screen, you can take it away. Okay. Thank you guys so much um, for inviting me to come and talk to you who I happen to admire, which are the educators. So give me one second and I will share my screen. And get a great point up and ready for you guys. All right. Takes a second. Are we good with the screen? You can see it. Okay, awesome. Um, so first and foremost, a huge thank you um, to everyone for uh, inviting me to come and talk today about our little organization and our um, education, our research and then our education efforts that we are trying to build. Um, we definitely have focused a lot on research in the past years, but I'll, I'm going to kind of talk about uh, where we want to be in the future, and it will probably rely a little bit on your help as educators to get us there. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Shark Trek, and it's not a perfectly formed product just yet. Um, we are going to definitely need some input from educators here in the United States to help us uh, see it to um, see it to the finish line, but we think it's a really great idea. So hopefully we'll get some great feedback from you guys um, as well. Uh, and just to put some stuff into perspective, um, my name's Hannah. I um, decided that I was gonna ride horses my entire life and then all of a sudden did a hard left turn uh, when I was a senior in high school and decided, nope, marine biology, and I shocked everyone in my family. Uh, so I've never really done anything in like the normal straight fashion. Everything's sort of been a little of a meandering journey, as you would say. Um, but I followed the academic journey, uh, sort of the typical one where I got my undergrad and then I went to grad school in South Africa. Um, and the reason I bring that up is just because uh, that was where I kind of formed the idea that like the science that we do as scientists shouldn't just stay in a bubble. Um, we are definitely a what mattered to me and what I prioritized was the fact that that science should definitely be obviously shared with policymakers. Um, so that kind of was a theme moving forward out of out of grad school. And the reason that happened was because in South Africa, I happened to be there in a time when there really weren't a lot of research assistants. I was kind of stretched a little thin on other people's projects. My master's ended up taking four years um, oops and because uh, I was helping a lot of other people in a lot of different projects that had to do with all sorts of different stakeholders meaning the businesses the um, local government the local school children um, so we sort of got to kind of get my fingers in all the different pots and I realized how applicable and valuable it was and benefited everybody when we shared that science um, and then when I came back to the states I was looking 
fortunate enough to find a position with a big nonprofit called Shark Savers, where that was literally my job was to find the science and the data to support their conservation campaign. So it was like a perfect win for me. Um, and that was, I was seeing the science that I understood from my training be applied to education programs. Um, and then furthermore into changing some really big policies on a global level. So that was really exciting. And I think further bolstered my idea that that was really important. So unfortunately, Shark Savers dissolved as an organization and it left sort of an open space here in Florida. I'm, I'm sure you guys, I'm well aware that there's a lot of organizations doing amazing work. Um, but in this particular like field of research and then translational to like education and policy, um, I didn't really see too many people doing it. It's mostly uh, universities that are doing a lot of the shark research. Um, so I thought this is kind of a niche that we can step in and maybe help um, fill. So much to my, I don't know if it was a good idea or not, <laughs> or not but we started our own nonprofit in 2016 called the American Shark Conservancy. Um, we had sort of been inspired by the South African Shark Conservancy, which was started by a master's student um, in South Africa. So we sort of modeled it after And the whole idea was to create kind of two bubbles. I would be our research and that's what our training was for. Um, that's why we went to grad school. That's why, you know, passion, science is the passion that I have. Um, and then the shark smart side, which I really wanted, which was a program that I really wanted to see grow and finding different ways of communicating and educating people and kids about uh, the research we were doing, because that's where I saw the benefit. Um, so right now we have a couple of research projects, field research projects, that um, I think was mentioned sort of in the, in the introduction. Um, and basically, it's we work with the anglers and we also work with the dive community um, on two um, pretty broad research projects. Uh, and then we try to take that data and take those, our real world experiences as, sci as scientists and communicate that. And we've had a really great relationship with the South Florida Science Center, which has sort of been our outlet to reach um, um, a lot of kids through their programming. Uh, so that's been really a lot of fun to develop, kind of out of our wheelhouse, which is why we like talking to you guys, because we could definitely use some <laughs> feedback and input. Um, so if you guys are interested in science, I'm assuming, uh, this is a little bit about our research. Um, we have a kind of a broad scale recreational shark fishing research program right now. So our project, our most recent project that got funded was uh, looking at at post-release mortality of great hammerheads that were caught in the shore-based shark fishery. Uh, so it's kind of a weird, kind of quiet um, underground fishery that may or may not be having an impact on these vulnerable species, but we really didn't ever, we didn't have any data. So both the state and federal biologists agreed that that information would be very useful moving forward um, with policy. So we were really happy to get involved with that, and I'll kind of explain a little bit more about how we uh, got into it and, and what the methods look like. So we also participate in the longest running mark recapture study. Um, basically, NOAA runs this tagging study and has done for decades. And it's one of the longest uh, running Uh, for any animal group. So it's been decades of catching sharks, tagging them uh, with the little static tags and then all of the recaptures and collecting all of that, that data. So we help participate in that as well. Uh, we have a genetics program a project that we're doing with the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, we're looking into some research projects based on depredation, which is I guess another word for anglers being angry that the sharks are eating their catch. So depredation is sort of a kind of a tough PR <laughs> situation uh, scientifically when we're dealing with anglers who are wanting to obviously see their catch make it to the boat without a big chunk missing out of it. So that's another um, aspect that we're kind of building a project around. And then socioeconomics, which um, again, is completely out of my wheelhouse, but we are lucky to partner with some social scientists in uh, Canada who've been really helpful, um, and I work with them in the post-release mortality study. So we've gotten into the socioeconomics to describe fisheries and people. 
lens um, to fish, which will help better manage them. Um, and then we also have the Florida Shark Survey, and we have kind of two aspects to that one, which is a, uh, we utilize the divers in the diving industry, and another is just an independent study of uh, using grubs, which I will kind of show you in a second. <laughs> So it's been really interesting with our recreational shark fishing um, project. So there's a handful, well, there's probably a lot more. We're finding out more um, people who like to target uh, hammerheads seasonally throughout the state of Florida. So hammerheads, if you're familiar at all with their biology, uh, they're quite vulnerable to stress. Uh, so there's some kids that can handle a test pretty easily. There's others that will chew off the end of their pencil and freak out and get get really stressed and flushed and you can see how their bodies change physiologically. Uh, so hammerheads are that other kid. <laughs> so they don't handle it quite very, very well um, in other types of capture. They seem to stress a lot and that can ultimately lead to um, their death. So because it's such a vulnerable species and there is not that much information about their physiology, we decided our method was to just attach a satellite tag, um, and if my cursor works, uh, circling that tag kind of hanging off the side of the shark right under its very tall dorsal fin. So these satellite tags are very specific in this kind of study, meaning the shark swims off and we hope that we don't hear from it. <laughs> Most of the time you put tags on and you really want to know where the shark's moving and all the data. Uh, but in this case, that tag will report either on um, two circumstances. One, after 28 days of being on the shark's back, um, then it will pop off and ping and send the, the, all of that in packages of information to the satellite, and then the satellite emails us pages and pages because it's collecting information every five minutes for 28 days. So it's a lot, a lot of numbers. <laughs> Um, and the second circumstance when we see that tag is when uh, the shark has actually stayed at a constant depth for three days. And that's going to indicate a mortality because in an, a natural setting, those sharks aren't necessarily going to be um, staying at a constant depth for three days. So unfortunately, that would indicate a mortality. So the graph um, in this picture, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, it's, that's at the time of release at the shoreline. And then it's basically just showing the depth use of that shark. So she swam off, she dropped down. Um, within 10 minutes, she was already at 60 meters. So she dove down pretty deep really quickly. But there's all sorts of yo-yo patterns here, which is considered um, somewhat a normal recovery profile for a, sh a fish that has been released from fishing, from a fishing event. Um, so this one actually survived. The tag stayed on, I think it shed prematurely after a couple of days, but um, basically we were able to get a full set of, uh, I think, seven to 10 days of this kind of information. So we're getting these data files that are really, really huge. And that's, again, what's going to kind of play into our uh, great shark trek. Um, this is actually one of our research assistants, Gretchen, who is tagging this bull shark that has been caught from shore with the static tags from the mark recapture study. Uh, and then she's able to take a little fin clip off of that, which will go to the genetic study um, up in Chicago. Uh, so this is just sort of showing some of our, our field work as it goes on. Um, and I'm sure you guys are well aware, obviously, that uh, we have a pretty unique ecosystem here in Florida, um, our marine ecosystem, and where we're located in Jupiter, uh, you see the continental shelf come really close into, uh, into shore. And I'm sure, as you guys probably know, this just creates a really productive and diverse area. Uh, so it's able to support prey, predators. We've got a whole bunch of different habitats. Uh, so it was, even though most of my studying was originally done in South Africa, in the South African I got back here, we really started looking at it, um, and we noticed that this was a really unique area, and we have so many divers, it's a really busy dive industry here, and so we thought maybe we should be capitalizing um, on those divers, and basically the dive industry that's thrive, that's, well, unfortunately I don't think it's thriving at the moment, but it will be, <laughs> will be again. Um, so we kind of picked a chunk of the area um, based on the, some of the oceanographic um, data that we could get our hands on 
created the Florida Shark Survey. So we use a standardized um, diver video, diver handled video survey. Um, and we want just the idea is to monitor um, and create a long term data set of the sharks that hang out between Jupiter and Fort Lauderdale. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get down to Fort Lauderdale very often. Uh, so we have basically been Jupiter to Boynton Beach uh, for about four years now, been taking these long-term um, data collection trips. So please excuse the clip art, <laughs> my artistic rendering of what this actually looks like. Um, this was done a little while ago. I, I should probably update this. Uh, but it does explain exactly what our, our diver surveys look like. Uh, so we have a dive float that on the top has a GPS logger that's able to tr um, track our exact coordinates as we drift. So all the dives are drift dives. So it goes in, uh, we start the logger as we drift north, we will be able to later down where what areas we've covered. And then um, the camera setup is really, really simple with the camera and two paired lasers that are parallel. Uh, so they actually will take an image, the camera will take an image of the two dots that are a fixed distance apart. So that when we get the pictures back, we can actually very easily put them into um, a very simple software image J and it can give us a pretty accurate, since we know the distance between the lasers, we can get this, uh, these length measurements. Uh, that'll make it a little bit easier. Because if you ever talk to a diver or fisherman, sometimes it's a little difficult uh, to get them to give you a really accurate length. Uh, there's a little bit of exaggeration that maybe goes on sometimes. So this is a, a really pretty simple uh, way to capture that information in a standardized way, and that's, we know that it's quite accurate. Um, let's see. So these are just some pictures of, of what our diver survey looks like. Uh, this is the front in the middle, the two lasers that are affixed to a tray. So we know that they're parallel. They've been tested uh, to know that they're parallel. Um, and then we also have a GoPro running in case our stills aren't capturing something that's going on. Uh, we just have the GoPro running. So again, we've got hours of video footage um, that we need to be analyzing constantly. So another big data set for from some of our uh, projects. Um, in the lower left, we were really Um, an image of a smooth hair species. Uh, so that's kind of what was in the season when they were here. Uh, this is how big it was. Um, and then having the images, because I have a terrible memory, so I need to have pictures to tell me, oh, that's right, we saw 16 silky sharks, five were male, et cetera. So that's where the camera comes in really handy. Uh, and then the picture on the right is just the picture, hopefully you can see it's a light green color, um, but a picture of me taking a picture of one of our, our local lemon sharks. So this is kind of what it what the resulting image looks like. Um, and again, we have hundreds of pictures of sharks that we've captured over four years. So again, big data sets that we can work with. Uh, so the lemon shark that we often see in the inshore areas, we can start to make those um, that that's kind of their separation from species like the uh, sandbar sharks. So over time, we're seeing trends that they don't really kind of cross over into what we would call offshore habitat. That's kind of the area for the sandbars and for the um, silkies and some of what we would consider pelagic species. Um, the other point of the pictures is basically to show that we also are given pictures a lot of the time. And if we didn't have the lasers, uh, we couldn't really tell the difference between the two sizes of the sharks. Um, so it just leaves a big chunk of information off uh, which is really critical in thinking about age classes and if we get pictures of the same individual over time, uh, we can use that those lasers and those measurements to determine how much they grow and how fast. 
So if I was given the two pictures without the lasers, which again are these tiny little dots <laughs> inside the yellow circle, we wouldn't really be able to know um, how long these sharks were or that there was a length difference, but because we have them, we can see here, obviously the sandbar is quite smaller uh, than the lemon shark. So the second kind of part of that are BRUVs. Um, we use dated remote underwater video systems, which are very simply a frame that holds a camera and a bait crate. So the It's just that maybe the dive surveys are missing certain species, um, or maybe they're attracting species because we are drifting along, whereas these are stationary without divers. So the diver will orientate it into the um, current, or sometimes we're able to, if the current's not too bad, we can just drop it right down and it'll settle and nobody actually has to go into the water. We take all sorts of environmental parameters, uh, and then we start to see changes over seasons and time in the same way. And then this fun contraption here, um, if you guys are at all familiar with uh, telemetry or biotelemetry, which I will talk about in a second. Uh, so this is a receiver. Uh, normally these are actually acoustic receivers and they're usually uh, anchored to the sea floor in certain patterns all up and down our coast, um, managed by a whole bunch of different organizations. Uh, in this case, we actually let it float along with us and we tie it to the bait rope. Uh, so in this case, we are able to hear any tagged sharks or turtle. There's other species that are also um, tagged with acoustic tags. And they're about the size of a tube of chapstick. And they, you make a little incision and insert a tag. And that tag has a frequency uh, that's specific to that shark. So as we float along, even if we can't visually see it, we will be able to capture uh, whether or not there's a tagged shark nearby. So that's a whole bunch of data and projects and things that we're interested in studying as scientists. Um, and then true to what we really wanted to see happen was kind of translating it or communicating that um, along the lines to uh, the regular community, uh, people who are interested. We do a lot of talks at dive shops. So we've, we've done a lot of in-person presentations over the last couple of years. Obviously, that's not happening right now. Um, but our, our audiences can range from general public to schools um, to workshops. We're working on a professional development course that we would love to get feedback on as well. So I'll have all of my contact details at the end, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, and we can be found at all the community events and really it's just a chance for us to kind of feel like our science is going somewhere. It's getting translated, communicated. As times are changing, we have been able to switch a lot of that to online, um, just things like this, virtual conferences and webinars. And we are negotiating to create a formal course for people who are interested in um, shark recent and updated shark research and conservation measures um, to get that kind of information out to the public as well. So initially all of this first work um, inspired the Great Shark Trek. So we have all these data sets, we've tagged a bunch of sharks. Um, so how can we best sort of capitalize, like what's the best way to get that information out there? How can it be used other than obviously our publications and technical reports and things like that? Uh, We have large coastal sharks here. So that very first data set that we had was inspired by that work. And we were uh, catching pretty much any species that we could catch off the coast of Jupiter. Um, in the left-hand side, I think you can see the stripes. So we had tiger sharks and we took a whole host of measurements. Um, I think this is a sandbar shark. The dorsal fin here and the head, you can see a hammerhead. We um, did a whole bunch of data collection for each one of these animals, and then we also tagged them with those acoustic tags. So this is kind of a, a little bit of a squeamish picture, but uh, so a small incision is made on the side of the shark's abdomen. 
And then the tag, which is this bright orange uh, tag right here is pushed in and then a quick suture is made. And to be honest with you, we saw the same sharks uh, that we had tagged about a couple of days later via pictures from the dive industry and it had healed very, very quickly. Um, so we were definitely made sure of that. And then this is a picture of the acoustic receiver that I showed on the bait rope. This is actually how they're most normally used um, on these systems which are anchored into the sand and there's a, an entire array up the entire east coast. So every time, I think we tagged over 111 lemon sharks and every time one of those swam by a receiver, we actually were getting information. That receiver was collecting that in like that signal which we could tie back to a real life shark um, we would get these sheets and sheets, Excel spreadsheets, of whenever a shark would swim by and a receiver would detect that. So you have 1100, or, um, 111 lemon sharks, just lemon sharks, swimming by, you know, hundreds of receivers. That's a lot, a lot of data. So that's kind of inspired the idea of the Great Shark Trek um, for kids the first version. Um, and so this is just to kind of show you what those results look like uh, per month over the uh, years of 2008 to 2011. Um, you could see we actually have a very, which we kind of knew about already, but an aggregation of lemon sharks. So all of that detection data um, got normalized and this was the kind of the results. We know in January through March, we have a strong presence of lemon sharks here in Florida. So knowing all those things and having the data in our hands, we were like, oh, well, you know, we get requests all the time to do these kids programs. Um, like I said, we were working with the South Florida Science Center, still are. Uh, so first it was, it's a very excited picture of me, sorry. <laughs> uh, first, uh, we decided that it'd be pretty fun to make a game of it. Um, so we started this in-person program at the Science Center. Uh, so we kind of reviewed as much as we could, again, with not much of an education um, background, uh, the Sunshine State standards. Uh, we struggled to read through and try to figure out what was most important and how to apply them. We created a lesson plan, uh, which we think was... seem to have through the science center we were able to do this and recreate exactly a kind of a mock-up of catching and tagging the sharks and then using the real time like the actual data from the sharks that we um, caught in the project for the kids to play with and to figure out what does that information mean what's the story why did we ask those questions how did we try to answer them um, so that's kind of why i was mentioning all of the data that we've collected Collected, um, we did um, data into lesson plans and resources for teachers and educators to use. So these were actually really, really cute activities. <laughs> I might be biased, um, but they're really cute activities. So we invested in some really cute stuffed sharks. Uh, they had to um, we coached them on exactly what the fishing would be like. Uh, so so there was a line tied to the shark. The kids had to pull it in really, really quickly. So they had a um, data handler, a data person that had to write down the GPS coordinates that we would read. Um, uh, right here on the right hand side on our on our data sheets. Um, so we taught them about having to have a blanket over the eyes to keep the animals calm, um, and we also had to and how, why we wanted to have a hose. So there was a section of hose. So someone's job was to make sure that that animal had a hose and explaining why we talked a little bit about biology and um, physiology and all of that good stuff. Um, so this was the first, first version of it. All right. Sorry, I went too fast. Oh no, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> Sorry about that. So just really quickly, um, the socioeconomics and the 
shark um, post-release mortality study introduced me to a great group out of Carleton University um, and in Canada. And they, as fisheries biologists, got some funding to create a very, very cool project, which they have called Aquatrax Learning. So most of them stuff. Uh, so the examples I'm going to show you through Aquatrax is actually going to be Pacific Salmon. Uh, but we think with all of the data that we have and all the content we have and the knowledge we have about sharks, we could actually really easy kind of plug and play a shark version of this. So I'm going to introduce you to Aquatrax as um, a project. It is based out of Canada. Um, it is free, free resources, which is always good. Um, loved their vision and uh, with obviously incorporating all of their feedback, uh, what was important and useful for them. So we just love the fact that it was bringing the movement of wildlife and real data into classrooms. Um, it is free, but currently the resources are, the project was funded mostly just for Canadian schools. Um, so right now, now, like I said, their focus is on Pacific salmon, uh, but I think you guys will see that the quality of their product is pretty amazing. I'm really just proud that the <laughs> fisheries scientists were able to create something that's so cool. Um, so their mission is to promote the access to active researchers and the world of scientific data into classrooms and STEM career awareness. And that just really struck home with us here at ASC. Uh, that's exactly what we want our arm of uh, shark smart art stuff to do. It was created by biologists, lab managers, communication specialists, educators, so it was a big collaborative effort in creating some of these, and it's it's still underway. Um, it's still under development a little bit, but there's some really great resources already online. So I'm gonna see if I can play this video for you guys. That looks good. Let me know if there's any issues with volume. Fish in Canada face many challenges. Climate change, habitat destruction, and pollution. How do fish respond to stressful environments? To find out, scientists attach electronic tags to fish to track their movements and behavior. Each tag sends out a signal that scientists can hear and record. Together, the signals from many fish provide information on where and when they are swimming in the wild. In classrooms across Canada, wouldn't it be great if students could see what these scientists are seeing and use the information they collect in learning activities? That's what a program called Aquatrax does. Aquatrax is a free, bilingual, curriculum-based information on the movement of fish and other wild animals into them. It's a great way to help students explore what's happening in nature right now, introduce conservation issues that face us all, and inspire students to become tomorrow's scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. Are you a teacher interested in bringing Aquatrax to your classroom, or a researcher who would like your data to be used in Aquatrax lesson plans? Visit aquatrax.ca for more information. Lots of logos. <laughs> so that's just sort of a quick um, rundown of what uh, their main plan is and their main mission at Aquatrax. Um, and so if you have a second to visit the website, I definitely say it's, it's worth it. You can download all of the stuff that they have um, available and you can reach out to them as well. Um, but I really wanted to show because we're building the relationship with them and they're, they're saying, you know, look, we've here in Florida, um, sharks here in Canada, a shark module is definitely uh, a really good idea. So we've partnered with them. They're excited about it. We're excited about it. So I'll show you some of the Pacific salmon resources that are available uh, and how they sort of played out. And then we can, you know, dream about how that great shark trek is going to is going to look as well. Um, so they offer a whole lot of resources on their website right now. Again, the species they're dealing with is Pacific salmon. And they have three different age groups. Um, this, I believe, is the youngest, the junior age group, but each one of these resources are available for each age group. 
Um, so including a bio, a, a video all about biotelemetry, the science that's used in collecting the data that the kids are going to work with, um, videos, profiles, a whole lesson plan. Um, obviously, the curriculum standards are all based on Canadian curriculum standards, um, the teacher survey, answer keys, etc. So it should be um, a full module that's really helpful to educators. So I just wanted to press play really quickly and see if I can fast forward a little bit if it's not going to work. Just so you can see the level of um, development they've done so far. So I'm an aquatic biologist. That means that I study things living in the water. I spend a lot of time on riverbanks like this one, tracking fish movement. Why? Because knowing where fish move and why can help us conserve and protect them. Biologists track many types of animals to learn more about what they do and where they live. Some animals in North America, for example, birds and butterflies, travel south in the winter to leave the extreme cold. Others, like the caribou, migrate seasonally between rich feeding grounds and protected areas to raise their young. Salmon leave their home rivers soon and then return to the very place they were born to reproduce. So there's eight minutes, I will, obviously you can click on the video on their website to access the full video, um, but it walks you through even mentioned sharks. Uh, so they have some animation available already about satellite tagging sharks. Um, but that's just an idea <laughs> of uh, sort of the products that they're working together. And those are the actual PhD students in, in the lab that are working on the data that they show in the videos. Um, so just a closer look at some of the things that we would replicate for our sharks. Um, the fact sheet for the species profiles obviously includes all sorts of biology and life history um, information about that species, um, movement, environmental. They even include a cultural connection, uh, which I further info links for teachers and students alike. Then they have developed some plans in the case study for the Pacific salmon. Um, they really do explain from, like I said, the beginning of why are we asking the question, what were the methods used, and sort of really lays out the full aspect of why the research is undertaken. Um, in pretty easy to digest words, which I think is why the collaboration with the educators has been so important. Um, so in the case of the Pacific salmon, they have data from scientists who collected both um, types of, of the, both um, the salmon that in gill nets, and those were considered the ones that were stressed, and the ones that were just kept captured in the regular nets were the controls. Um, and so then they track the movement of those salmon once they were released. Uh, and then they have a set of assignments and um, assessments that the kids can go through. And then at the end, they, off they obviously have um, further questions, what they call debate questions. Uh, so some of the boxes that they work to tick, um, they cover lots of different aspects and it's very customizable. Uh, so in this particular, And they're covering all sorts of things like movement and speed, they have medians, means, scatter plots. Um, they talk a lot about ecology, life cycles, uh, anthropogenic issues, which I particularly like. Um, it's not just kind of a dry story of like, okay, here are numbers. Um, it kind of builds a story around that information. And they talk about stakeholder conflicts over resources, which sounds complicated, but uh, I think even the kids here in Florida know that there's a little bit of a, you know, heads that bump because a lot of different people like to use the ocean in a lot of different ways. So it's kind of a crazy slide, but basically they are given um, information on the fish. So fish number 21 gets plotted onto uh, the map of the river here by the kids. Um, days since the release, so at four, five, and six 
days they can see where the fish are. Um, I think in the example that their newer example, they actually use a string to follow and, and measure out with the scale bar to see actually physically how far those those fish had gone down the river, so they can fill in those. Um, they create scatter plots and stem and leaf plots. Um, so again, lots lots of different options because of the amount of data that they have, which also makes me feel good because those are the kind of questions, sets of data that we have. So just kind of a look at some of their, um, you know, uh, worksheets that they have created. They're, I think the color scheme is beautiful. <laughs> so that's, that's definitely for me. Um, but they talk about creating the means and medians, like some of the boxes I said that they had aimed on ticking. Um, and again, the, the, the data that's in the Excel spreadsheet that's available as an open resource for any educator is directly from a research project that's going on in that lab. So those fish numbers and the locations and the days since release is all something that the kids can then relate back to and be like, that was an actual fish and this is where it's going down the river. Um, so this, they, the worksheet on the right also shows the scatter plots that can be created from it um, and leaves lots of uh, room for discussion. So I also think that the exit cards are quite sweet. <laughs> uh, so when they've done this and tested it in schools with different classrooms and different educators, uh, this was an indicator to me. I don't, again, know too much about um, the study of education, but it was really heartening to see. And this is something, obviously, working with sharks, we can say out loud the word sharks, and a lot of kids perk up. So we think that's a really good um, sort of flashy thing to flash in front of the kids and that hooks them, you know, to get, uh, kind of tricks them into learning. <laughs> um, and then to see that they can do this with salmon and that the kids really seem to get it. Um, you know, the one kid was, they learned that the stressed fish dies sooner um, than control fish. They also learned the stressed fish takes longer uh, than the control fish, um, even if they go to the same place. So he's learning that a stress Um, so, and that the question biologists still have is how can we make fish live better, which I think is a really valid, valid question. So there were some really great um, exit cards that I think demonstrated that these kids were really picking up on the broader um, concepts. And the feedback was also quite sweet. <laughs> I liked the thing. It was fun and hard. I mean, I think that's, I, again, I'm not an educator, but I think that's a pretty good um, response from from some of the kids that were doing these activities. Um, but it, it also, a lot of the feedback indicated that they really appreciated it because they could think of it as uh, a real, like those numbers actually represented work that was being done by a real life scientist. Um, and then that data, those numbers were actually uh, attributed to an actual live fish. So uh, that's kind of the things that sparked us at ASC. We're like, yeah, that's, that seems to be what gets the kids pretty excited. And if we can to teach them the concepts of the math concepts, the geography, and all the rest of the boxes, um, we should definitely be capitalizing on these giant data sets that we have. So I've talked about Pacific salmon for 20 minutes, so that's kind of confusing, but um, basically we want to move things forward with Aquatrax. Um, and so what are we talking, you know, where are the sharks coming into this? So our relationship with Aquatrax and their team is growing. Um, we're searching out our own funding to sort of contract them to help us build uh, the U.S. side of things. Um, but we definitely need to work with some Florida educators and ed education advisors um, and to figure out exactly what the resources are that educators uh, need or want and how in what form should they come. Um, so we're really looking for some feedback as we move forward. I think it's going to be quite easy easy to take and sort of replace the salmon stuff, sort of a plug and play kind of thing. I think it's going to be quite easy because we have so much information, uh, but it's really putting it into the form of a resource that educators need and want. Um, and so replacing, uh, the, obviously, like I said, replacing that salmon content with the shark content really shouldn't be a problem. 
Um, ASC has files and files of, of species profiles. Um, so we can cover, I think we've, uh, we're up to about 26 species that we have pretty comprehensive um, pro species profiles on. So as for images and content and the, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, I think we are pretty well positioned to uh, make that part of the project um, pretty quickly. Uh, so that shouldn't be, that's the easy part for us. <laughs> um, and then also we want to organize all of our data sets. So we're building it with Aquatrax that they use. How do they say that? Uh, what to do with our numbers uh, to make it really usable and friendly uh, for these activities and educators across um, Florida and you know hopefully throughout the US. So ultimately the idea is then to create the Great Shark Trek version two. So that, that is sort of the concept of the work that we've done. I don't know if I went a little too fast maybe. Um, I apologize. Sometimes I talk a little fast, um, but I'm really happy, I guess, to take uh, any questions if they've popped up, if um, you want to just let me know what you want me to do. But all of our contact information, um, our website's americansharkconservancy.org. Um, please check out Aquatrax because their website is um, beautiful and see what those resources are. Um, and then basically we will just kind of be working within that framework. Um, and if you have any questions or things that you we don't have time to talk about today, uh, my name's Hannah, Hannah at americansharkconservancy.org. It's a very long email, but <laughs> hopefully you can just like, take a screenshot and make it a little easier on yourself, um, but we would love to hear from you. Yeah, thanks so much, Hannah. Um, I've been kind of keeping track of questions as they were popping up in the chat feed, and then I also did in the chat put a link to your website um, and the Aqua uh, Aquatrax uh, website. So people can check that out in the chat. But the first question that popped up was from Lauren and she says, do you work with BBFS to collect data? Mm -hmm. So the first um, shark trek was based on data that we collected with uh, the Bimini Shark Lab. Um, so it was actually one of their PhD students, uh, Steve Kessel, it was his project. And uh, so that was the field work and the analysis that we did was all based on um, Bimini Shark Lab's uh, work on Jupiter. Um, and as so far as the work that they do in Bimini, um, very, but other than that, uh, mostly all the stuff that happens here off the coast here in Jupiter. Awesome, thanks. And then we have another um, question from Guinevere. She says, do you guys ever collect or receive back the tags that pop off? So at $2,000 a pop, um, we would love to get the tags back because we could get a very discounted, <laughs> discounted rate to have them sort of um, redone. But unfortunately, our, our sharks seem to swim off into the Gulf. And by the time we hear from the tag after three days, uh, they're somewhere off the coast of Daytona, if not Jacksonville. Um, and the cost of trying to retrieve them would probably offset the cost of the tag. So unfortunately, we don't uh, often get them back. There was one that got caught in some mangroves, um, supposedly up the coast a little bit. We did a little look, um, but we couldn't find it, unfortunately. Understandable. Uh, let's see, where's my next question? Um, about the aqua tracks, uh, the activities you were showing, what grade level were those uh, geared to? And that was from Marsha. Okay, the, and you, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. Oh, I think the my... uh, aqua tracks lessons that you were showing from the salmon, what grade level were those geared to? That is the youngest group, and I want to say that it was probably, um, I want to say early, or uh, sorry, late elementary, I think is what they were telling me. Um, they, they break down the grades a little differently, so that's kind of why they went with categories like junior, um, intermediate, and then I, I can't remember what the third one is, but the third one's a high school, si um, high school age. So if you go on their website, you can pick which one and kind of see the difference. Um, 
And I think it is a little, little bit different between the Canadian education system and the US one. Um, so that's also something we would need help with and kind of translating that. Okay, awesome. Another question from Lauren. Um, are these species profiles, uh, the species profiles you showed available on your website? They will be soon. I hate saying that because it just sounds kind of like a cop out. Um, if you want to email me, I can certainly send you a clean PDF of them. Um, we're having some website redesigns going on, um, so they're not up currently, but I'd be happy to share them um, if you send me an email. Yeah, I had a question. Is that um, shark lesson with the stuffed sharks and the, is that available? Because that looks so cool that you guys designed. Is that available? Yes, again, through um, email. You can email okay. us. We have a, a PDF, everything explained out, the lesson plans and everything, and the material kits and stuff. Okay. I'm making a note. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, super cool. Um, let's see. I think, um, does anyone else have any questions? I feel like I got all the questions out of the chat. Well, if there's no other questions, I have a few. Um, well, thank you for all of these great questions and thanks Hannah so much for taking the time to answer them. Um, a couple of notes before everyone logs off, please wait a second. Um, please don't forget to renew your FEMC membership. Um, we know that many of you renew your membership automatically this time of year and it's an option usually included in our conference fees and without a regular conference, you don't automatically renew your membership. So um, in just one second in the chat, I'm going to include a link to do that. Um, so here that is. Um, so please uh, take the time to uh, do that. We'd love that. And then also, if you've enjoyed today's session, um, please consider uh, uh, donating to FEMC. Our regular annual conference is a great source of funding for our organization. And unfortunately, we weren't able to recover all the costs that went into planning what would have been our amazing in-person in conference. So thank you to, uh, for continuing to allow us to put on our events and for wonderful marine science educators such as yourself, uh, you can donate on our GoFundMe page, uh, which is gonna be here in the chat. Um, so finally, don't forget to join us on our next presentation, which is gonna be Sea Turtles with Jamie Reniker today at four. And the link for that also is going in the chat. So um, I hope you guys had a wonderful session today. I wanna one more time thank Hannah for joining us and thank you for all uh, joining us. And I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you guys so much. Stay safe. All right. Bye, everyone.